Hi, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Seng, and I'm here for the Health Research Council of the American Psychological Association's Division 38, Health Psychology Division. Today we're talking with Dr. Cheryl Giscombe about uh, health disparities and stress. So, uh, thank you for being willing to come and chat with us. Thank you for having me, I'm so excited. Absolutely. So, tell me a little bit about what does health disparity mean? Yes, well, as you mentioned, my research focuses on health disparity, and when we think about the word disparity, it means different. And so when we're talking about health disparity, often we're talking about disproportionately high rates of adverse health outcomes or health conditions among vulnerable populations, and usually they may include ethnic um, groups, different ethnic groups such as African Americans, Hispanic, Latino Americans, Native Americans, or American Indians, um, but you may also think about other groups such as sexual minorities um, and other groups that for whatever reason, contextually, they have had social experiences that contribute to adverse rates of health conditions that we are consider undesirable. Okay, so it's whenever a group of people has had a social environment that has led to higher rates of disease or some other negative health outcome. Yes, that's correct. And um, just to differentiate that also from something we call health care disparities, is when those disproportionately high rates of health outcomes are not only related to the social conditions that the individuals experience, but the ways in which they interact with the healthcare system. Okay. And so then they may have low access or they may use health resources differently because of the interactions with that. System. Okay. So there's two kind of things yes, here. Health and health care disparities. Health, health disparities mm -hmm. are when the actual diseases or conditions mm -hmm. are different among people. Health care disparities is when people have different access to health care, to doctors. Right. And or there's um, limitations in the way they interact. And so health care disparities also lead to health disparities. Okay, okay. all right, okay. so the, yeah. a yes. complicated turn of events yes. that leads some group of people to have worse health than others. Yes, exactly, you said it so nicely. <laughs> so uh, I know that you study stress. Yeah. Can you tell me what is stress and how does it interact with these health disparities we've been talking about? Okay, yes, my research has focused on the psychological factors, what known as stress, which um, I'm a part of a working group that's led by Elizabeth Brondelow. We just gave a presentation, and um, that group did a great job, I think, today of defining stress as when resources are inadequate to meet demands in one's life situation. So stress can be events that occur that are considered stressful, or it can be people's perceptions or appraisals of those events. So events may happen to two different people, but an individual might appraise one as more stressful than someone else would. So I might be stuck in traffic, but I'm listening to my favorite radio station and that's not stressful. But somebody else who's stuck in traffic, they may be late for something and then that's more stressful for yes. them. Yes, so okay. it varies. Yes, exactly. And it's an emotional, often emotional, cognitive response to okay. a situation. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. So how does uh, stress work with health disparities? Well, stress can influence health disparities via at least two pathways. One is that stress can influence people's um, response or the ways in which they cope. And so, for instance, when we think about health outcomes, people may cope through smoking, they may cope through, um, they're, they're finding ways to make the situation better. So it could be through smoking cigarettes, it could be through sedentary health behaviors, it could be through overeating or eating soothing foods that comfort foods tend to be not as healthy for us. People can also tend to cope by the way they interact with others, which can then lead down the stream to health um, in, in undesirable health outcomes. But then also we know that stress influences physiological reactions in our body, so we call that stress reactivity. And so stress can influence cardiovascular factors, neuroendocrine, so stress can increase risk for um, morbidity and diabetes, stress increases risk for lupus morbidity. Um, there's just various outcomes such as birth outcomes can contribute to low birth weight and preterm delivery. So stress has behavioral as well as physiological reactions. Okay, so stress, it's bad for our health behaviors and it's bad for our health in general. Yes. So does stress differ between groups? 
Yes, so research is showing that stress does differ between groups and we know that stress is, you know, a part of life and then there's, there's you stress, so things that are happy, they seem still cause stress, but what we're talking about is undesirable stress or what we call psychological distress. And certain groups are exposed to more stressors or they have less resources to meet the demands of those stressors. And so health disparity populations, including um, people who are economically vulnerable or ethnic um, groups such as African Americans, Latinos, Hispanic Americans, who we see have disparate rates of chronic illness, also we find that they have higher rates of stress. And so we're trying to understand how we can address that. So have you done any work that suggests ways we might be able to address this problem? Yes, so my research focuses on just that. And um, one thing that I didn't mention is a growing body of research, particularly by members of the American Psychological Association, um, have found that for these groups, um, discrimination, exposure discrimination, racism, prejudice is also a very significant stressor, which might explain why these groups have more stress. So they're exposed and to a variety. Health. Yes, have a variety of stress exposure, and so um, it's important for us to be very specific about how we operationalize stress. How do we define stress? So stress could um, be individual stress. It could be my research looks at network stress. Also, so if we're especially for women in particular, we can ask a woman about individual stress. But often they report that the stressors that they experience as a result of the, their loved ones or family or friend mem friends who experience stress, that network stress is just as stressful as their own personal stress. So when we're looking at stress and health disparities, we need to take into consideration the gender and culturally relevant factors. Another um, area of research that I have is looking at something called, it's a conceptual framework I developed called Superwoman Schema. And it looks at how women and African American women in particular may have an ob perceived obligation to project an image of strength, to suppress emotions, to prioritize caregiving over self care, and how that um, phenomenon might influence not only stress, but the ways in which women cope with stress or delay health care seeking or health promoting behaviors because they're putting themselves you know, they're not prioritizing their own health yeah, because so of how they've been socialized, really, and what they perceive as their obligation to others. So you want to be strong, you want to be superwoman, you want to take care of other people, but that might actually lead to more stress and worse self in yes. the end. The preliminary research is showing correlations with stress, depressive symptoms, using food as a coping strategy, and so we're, we're looking at that more closely. All right. So where do you see your research going? Well, I'm moving into intervention research. I just completed a research study with a colleague named Susan Gaylord at UNC Chapel Hill and several other team members where we looked at mindfulness-based stress reduction. We looked at its cultural relevance in African Americans and we applied it to a stress management intervention for African Americans with prediabetes. Okay. And so that was a randomized controlled pilot feasibility study and we use mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative methods to understand is this an intervention that's acceptable, is it feasible, and does it have results. And so preliminary findings are showing that it has had some results on self-reported stress, but we're looking, we, we need to look at a larger trial to see how it may influence diabetes markers. Then also I'm looking at um, being more engaged in community academic partnerships. We know that in order to have sustainable, acceptable interventions, we need to engage community. And so for the last five years, I've developed a relationship with a community agency that addresses these various health disparities that we've discussed. And so we're working on interventions that will be acceptable to the community. And when the researchers leave, the community can continue that work because that's what's most important. All right. And then we need to know how our research can influence policy because not only individual, family, or community level interventions are not enough when we know that structural and institutional factors also may contribute to the ways in which people experience stress. So we're really trying to hit stress and racial yeah. disparities in healthcare from the ground up. Yes, that's right. All right. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you.